In the summer and fall of 1969, the American side of Niagara Falls stayed without water. It lasted six months. Researchers wanted to study the rock face of the falls. They were afraid it was going to become too unstable because of erosion. Erosion is the process when natural forces, such as water and wind, wear away earthen materials. For example, if you see glacial ice become muddy, it means erosion is happening. Three waterfalls that cross the international border between Canada and the United States together make something we know as the Magnificent Niagara Falls. The three waterfalls are the Horseshoe Falls, the American Falls, and the Bridal Veil Falls, in order from largest to smallest. The American Falls are fully on the American side, while the Horseshoe Falls are primarily on the Canadian side, divided by Goat Island. The Bridal Veil Falls, the smallest of them all, are on the American side, but separated from the others by Luna Island. Don't America and Canada have a cool natural border? Many didn't believe we could actually go against wild nature and stop such insane amounts of water from flowing. But we did it! It took a 600-foot dam across the enormous Niagara River to really shut down these astonishing falls. This means they had to divert 60,000 gallons of water every second so that the remaining flow traveled over the biggest horseshoe falls, yup, the ones that are completely on the Canadian side of the border. Over 27,000 tons of rock were used to construct that dam, and more than 1,000 trucks carried that rock back in the hot summer of 69. On June 12, the American Falls stopped after their continuous flow for more than 12,000 years. So the Horseshoe Falls then took the extra flow and absorbed it so that research could be done. But the locals were still worried. They knew it wasn't possible to control such amounts of water. They were afraid the water might take a different route and cause a catastrophic flood. They were worried the tourists wouldn't come anymore if teams didn't manage to make the waterfall flow again the way it used to. But tourists kept coming even that summer, and they got a unique chance to see something no one had ever seen before or after. During that period, there was even a temporary walkway built only 20 feet away from the edge of the now-dry falls. It helped workers to clean the bottom of what used to be a river, so tourists could go there and explore the wild landscape of the falls that was usually under the water, hostile, and not accessible to visitors at all. As they were exploring the dried bottom of the falls, researchers stumbled upon millions of different coins people had thrown in the water over decades, maybe to make a wish or for some other purpose. Wow, a Niagara Falls piggy bank! Well, they removed most of those coins. I wonder who got them. But in the past couple of decades, more and more tourists have been coming here. Imagine all the things they could find now. More coins, of course, but also lost cameras, errant drones, cell phones, and other things careless visitors could accidentally drop in the waterfalls. The idea of removing all the water and turning Niagara Falls into a desert proved to be possible. But it may need to be done again. In 2020, the media reported that two pedestrian bridges in Niagara Falls needed to be either replaced or repaired. No wonder, since they're almost 120 years old. These bridges are located above the rapids. Experts discuss whether they should divert the water once again or not. People talk about Niagara Falls a lot, and some believe they're among the tallest waterfalls in the world. But the truth is, they're not. They're famous, precious, and breathtaking. But when it comes to height, there are nearly 500 other waterfalls across the globe that are taller than Niagara. Let's take Angel Falls in Venezuela, for example. They're more than 3,000 feet tall. But what makes Niagara Falls so special, among other waterfalls, is the amount of water that flows over them. Very high waterfalls don't usually have great amounts of water. The combination of all those huge amounts of water and the height is what makes Niagara Falls so breathtaking. Also, they might be some of the fastest-moving waterfalls on our planet. The Niagara River appeared after the last ice age, together with the whole Great Lakes Basin. The Niagara River is part of it. 18,000 years ago, I wasn't around then, this awesome waterfall didn't exist. Ice sheets covered the area of southern Ontario. They were 1 to 2 miles thick. As the ice sheets were moving southward, they created the basin of the Great Lakes. Then they melted, releasing enormous amounts of water into the basins. Generally, the water we drink is fossil water. Only 1% of it renews through the year, with the remaining 99% coming from ice sheets. 
The Niagara Peninsula hasn't been beneath the ice for nearly 12,500 years. As the ice melted, the resulting water started to flow down through what later turned into Niagara River, Lake Erie, and Lake Ontario. It took a lot of time, but the water eventually eroded cliffs and formed these spectacular falls. Now, you might have noticed that the Niagara River is amazingly green. This specific color tells us how powerful the water is when it comes to erosion. Every minute, Niagara Falls spews over 60 tons of dissolved minerals. All that, together with dissolved salt and finely ground rock, makes the color so magnificent. People who live in the United States and Canada, or more precisely, over a million people who have access to the area, use the waters of Niagara River for different purposes. For example, fishing, getting drinking water, doing recreational activities, including swimming, boating, and bird watching, producing hydroelectric power, and so much more. Now, the first hydroelectric generating station in the world was built at the end of the 19th century, and it was right next to the falls. Pretty soon, it started paying off because people were getting electricity from it. But this electricity could travel only 300 feet, so something needed to be improved there. Nikola Tesla was the one who took up the challenge and made the necessary changes. He discovered that electricity could travel long distances if an alternating current was used. Today, several Niagara Falls power plants provide over 2 million kilowatts of power. Okay, I'll tell you another interesting thing. 1969 wasn't the only time when Niagara Falls stopped. Back in 1848, the water didn't flow over the falls for up to 40 hours. Now, the falls were already very popular among tourists and a useful source of energy for local people. So, no wonder they freaked out. Nature was to blame this time. Ice blocked the source of the Niagara River. An American farmer was the first one to notice it. It was March 29th, and he went for a walk right before midnight. Soon, he realized he couldn't hear the powerful roar of the falls. He quickly went to the edge of the river and stood there in shock. There was hardly any water. Factories and mills had to shut down because they depended on that water. Turtles were just wandering around. Fish didn't survive. Some people took a walk on the river bottom, taking little things they could find there as souvenirs. But two days later, on March 31st, people heard a distant rumbling coming from upriver. It was getting nearer and louder until a wall of water appeared in front of their eyes. And one of the world's greatest attractions that millions of tourists visit every year was back in business again. Magnificent and, in the end, invincible. As it should be. Uh, see the barrel? About four and a half feet tall? There's nothing unusual about it. Except for the fact that it's bobbing and dunking just above the churning chaos of Niagara Falls. Another moment or two, and the barrel's hurtling over the edge and toward the bottom of the waterfall more than 170 feet down. What you can't see is that there's a fool, I mean, person inside the barrel. Annie Edson Taylor was born into a family with eight kids. Her father was a flour mill owner. He passed away when the girl was 12, but he left enough money for his family to have a comfortable living. So, when Annie decided to build a school teacher career, there was nothing to prevent her from doing it. She even earned an honors degree after finishing a four-year-long training course. While studying, she met her future husband. Unfortunately, their marriage didn't last long. Sadly, Annie became a widow. The woman spent decades of her life in all kinds of teaching jobs and moving between different places. Years later, she ended up in Bay City, Michigan. She wanted to become a dancing instructor, but there wasn't any dancing schools in the city. No problem, Taylor opened up one of her own. In 1900, she moved to the city of Sault Ste. Marie to teach music. Later, she traveled to San Antonio, Texas, and even visited Mexico City in search of work. When this attempt failed, she returned to Bay City. But all this traveling, though exciting, left her with almost no money and very few belongings. She needed to work out a way to bolster her bank account for when she wouldn't be able to work anymore. One day, she was reading a newspaper article about the daredevils who had been riding out the dangerous rapids at the bottom of Niagara Falls. An idea occurred to her. Hmm, she thought, why don't I do better and actually plunge over the waterfall? If I survive, I'll become famous. 
In truth, Annie had no doubt she would get out of this adventure alive. She was an exceptionally determined and upbeat woman. That's why she immediately got down to work, putting her plan into action. Annie wasn't naive enough to believe she would manage to survive the fall without some kind of protection. That's why Annie chose to use a custom-made pickle barrel. She designed the vessel herself. First, she sketched a diagram and made a prototype out of cardboard. Then she handpicked each piece of wood that had to be used for the barrel. A local company that produced beverage kegs used this wood to construct the barrel. It was an uneven, 5-foot-tall and 3-foot-wide container made of white oak and weighing about 160 pounds. It was secured by 10 wide metal hoops. Inside the cask, there was a leather harness to prevent Annie from bouncing around and a mattress to cushion the fall. A massive 200-pound metal block was placed at the bottom of the barrel. It had to serve as ballast, keeping the barrel in the upright position. Soon, everything was ready for the show. Annie decided to perform it on her 63rd birthday, on October 24, 1901. Curiously, the woman told the reporter she was in her 40s. People who were supposed to help Taylor with her plunge were skeptical. Even on the day when it had to take place, the event was put off several times. The assistants were afraid that if something went wrong, they would be to blame. But finally, at about 4 p.m., the barrel was loaded onto a rowboat and Annie climbed inside. She was holding her lucky heart-shaped pillow. The assistant screwed down the lid and pumped in some fresh air. There had to be enough for her to breathe for one hour, but the entire trick was supposed to take much less time, about 20 minutes. Finally, the hole used for venting the air was corked, and the brave woman floated away on her risky business. Several thousand onlookers were eyeing the process. The container with Annie inside was towed from the Niagara River's deeper Canadian side toward the Horseshoe Falls. It's the largest of the two cascades that form Niagara Falls. Near Goat Island, the barrel was set adrift and floated toward the mighty cataract. Was Annie nervous? Yeah, that would be a great understatement. Her heart was beating wildly in her chest. Her breathing was fast, too fast. Her hands and feet were cold and her palms sweaty. It felt as if there wasn't enough air inside the wooden container. But the woman was determined to be brave. Suddenly, the barrel accelerated, caught in the current, and dashed toward the edge of the waterfall. People watching from the shore couldn't see it anymore. The thing was lost in the mist surrounding the whirling water. Inside her fragile shelter, Annie was listening to the roar of the falls. It was growing louder and louder. A moment of bizarre calm at the very edge, and the barrel plunged from the height greater than the Arc de Triomphe in Paris. The fall was shorter than Annie had expected. Mere seconds later, her vessel hit the surface and went underwater. The barrel was spinning wildly and tossed around like a twig. A moment later, it resurfaced. The vessel was intact, but water had already started to seep in. After drifting downstream for a while, the barrel came to a stop at a rock in the river. Immediately, Annie's assistants were next to it. A bunch of anxious men tore the lid off. Annie, seasick, bruised, and clutching her soaked pillow, was looking back at them. One of the rescuers was so shocked to see her alive that he grabbed a megaphone and shouted this news to the spectators. The Maid of the Mist, a tour boat lingering nearby, blew her horn to celebrate Annie's success. Annie said later that she had lost consciousness only once, right after the fall. The rest of the time, she was alert and feeling everything that was happening to the barrel. Annie found the fame she had been seeking. She was nicknamed the Goddess of Water and got celebrity status almost instantly after her adventure. People even wrote poems about her. Sadly, she didn't manage to earn as much money as she had hoped, and her fame was fleeting. Annie wrote memoirs, and she was going to sell the book near Niagara Falls. But her manager disappeared, having stolen her barrel. Annie spent almost all her savings on private detectives trying to get the thing back. She had been planning to use it as a prop while giving public speeches. Sometime later, the barrel was spotted in Chicago. But before Annie could get her hands on it, the barrel vanished again, this time for good. The only thing Annie could do was to pose for photographs at her souvenir stand. She also tried to write a novel and reconstruct her fall on film, but no movie was ever shown. 
In 1906, the woman even mentioned she could take a second plunge into the waterfall, but it never happened. Several years after Annie's stunt, both the Canadian and New York authorities introduced special laws. They were supposed to prevent risk-takers from following in the schoolteacher's daring footsteps. It didn't stop people from trying and facing huge fines. Well, dare I say it? It was more fun than a barrel of monkeys. <laughs> the calm and peaceful waters of the Strid in Bolton Abbey, England looked like something off of a postcard. But all things aren't as they seem, and this timid-looking river is actually one of the most dangerous stretches of water in the world. The Strid's serene-looking waters go up to 30 feet deep. That's about as deep as two double-decker buses stacked on top of each other. The river looks calm, but beneath the surface lies a powerful undercurrent that could easily overpower even the strongest of swimmers. Locals claim that the river has a 100% mortality rate when it comes to the unlucky people who have fallen in while trying to jump between the moss-covered banks. In Bolivia, running alongside the Amazon River is the Madidi National Park. This beautiful park spans more than 7,000 square miles and is one of the most biologically diverse regions on the planet. In the south of the park sit the glacier-covered peaks of the Andes Mountains, and in the north, there are tropical rainforests as far as the eye can see. Madidi is one of the most dangerous parks in the world. It's filled with poisonous and aggressive plants. Contact with them can result in unpleasant health issues. In the middle of the Pacific Ocean, you'll find the small beautiful island of Bikini Atoll. Filled with palm trees, white sand beaches, and crystal blue waters, you wouldn't think this place is actually a radioactive wasteland. Bikini Atoll was the site of numerous nuclear testing programs in the 1950s. Locals were forced to abandon their homes due to the dangerously high levels of radiation. The island is still uninhabited to this day. Its clear blue waters and luxurious floating hotel resorts make the Maldives a dream vacation spot for many. But they're slowly becoming a dangerous place to visit. Due to rising sea levels, the Maldives are slowly sinking. It's gotten so bad that they're even considering relocating the entire population. Meteora in Greece is famous for its natural beauty and vast complex rock formations. The town is filled with giant sandstone peaks, on top of which lie grandiose monasteries built by monks hundreds of years ago. The beautiful town is a popular but dangerous tourist destination. The stunning buildings sit right on the cliff's edge, with no railings or safety hazards to protect you. Be careful and watch where you go if you visit this lofty town. About 25 miles off the coast of Brazil is a small piece of land filled with towering rainforests and stunning tree-topped mountains. This island is widely recognized as one of the most dangerous places on the planet. Locals call this land Snake Island. The island is filled with over 4,000 venomous snakes. Bothrops, which are one of the most venomous species of snakes to ever exist, can be found on this island. Snake Island is so dangerous that Brazil has prohibited any visitors from setting foot there. An automatic lighthouse sits near the coast of the island, warning sailors to keep a safe distance. Haiti is one of the largest countries in the Caribbean. It's known for its white sand beaches, mountainous scenery, and year-round sunshine. The island is home to stunning five-star hotels and is a regular calling point for luxury cruise ships. Despite all that, this Caribbean island isn't always a safe place to visit. Haiti is one of the most hurricane-prone countries in the world. The geological structure of Haiti makes the land naturally prone to flooding. This makes hurricanes even more dangerous. Some areas of the country are still recovering from the infamous hurricane of 2010. From within the walls of the Hanging Temple in China, things seem calm and serene. It's a beautiful place to worship, filled with colorful traditional decorations and stunning architectural gems like beautiful archways. On the outside, though, it's a different story. The Hanging Temple is built into the edge of a cliff 250 feet into the air. Thousand-year-old beams of oak wood chiseled into the mountains keep the structure in place. The temple is filled with a maze of passageways, adding even more adrenaline thrills to this dangerous tourist spot. In the Russian Far East lies Kichpinich. It's a stratovolcano, meaning that it erupts more regularly than other volcanoes, but the lava is likely to cool and harden before spreading too far. 
the summit of Kikpinik is filled with high concentrations of the toxic gas hydrogen sulfide. The gas poses a serious threat to all living things, which is why there are no plants or animals in this area. If someone was to inhale this gas, they would feel unwell very quickly with fevers and dizziness. Yungus Road is a popular Bolivian cycling route that attracts over 25,000 tourists a year. The stunning route allows cyclists to travel through the Andean mountains of the north, race alongside the Amazon River, and finish their trip in Bolivia's capital city. Despite its popularity, this road is known to be the most dangerous road in Bolivia. The route has steep inclines of up to 2,000 feet, with barely any barriers along the way. The area is known for its extreme weather. Thick fogs, heavy rain, and even landslides occur along this road, endangering cyclists. In Zimbabwe, over 132 million gallons of the Zambezi River rush over the Victoria Falls every minute. At 400 feet tall, the stunning waterfall is one of the largest in the world and has become a popular tourist destination. If you happen to end up there at sunset, you're in for a beautiful sight. For those brave enough, you can go for a swim at the top of the falls in what locals call the Devil's Pool. You can wade up to the edge of the cliff and peek down at the crashing waters below. People have been known to slip over the small rocky barrier at the cliff's edge. In the heart of Siberia is the small Russian village of Oymyakon. The small village is frozen all year round and home to many winter activities. You can go ice fishing, sledding, and skiing. It's even home to several reindeer herds. However, the town is so cold that it's dangerous. With the lowest recorded temperature of negative 96.2 degrees Fahrenheit, this is the coldest inhabited place in the world. Only 500 inhabitants survive here, and it's not easy at all. Pipes freeze, so plumbing rarely works. The ground is frozen, so no crops grow. And even your eyelashes will freeze if you stay outside for too long. Sumatra is a large Indonesian island filled with unmatched natural beauty. You can walk alongside orangutans in the forest, swim in the clear waters, or take in the stunning architecture in Medan. However, an active volcano in the region called Mount Sinabung makes this island a risky place to visit. Mount Sinabung is prone to severely damaging eruptions, most recently in 2013, 2014, 2015, and 2016. Several nearby towns and villages have been devastatingly covered in lava and ash. The volcano is always closely monitored, but its eruptions can be impulsive and unpredictable. In the center of Brazil, you'll find Manaus, a large city known for its colorful architecture and lively culture. The city is home to some of the best museums in Brazil, along with grand theaters and stunning beaches. Manaus is in the heart of the Amazon rainforest and situated on the bank of the mighty Amazon River. The city is surrounded by life-threatening animals that lurk within the depths of the Amazon. Piranhas, anacondas, and vipers, just to name a few. In Tanzania, you'll come across the bright red waters of Lake Natron. The lake is filled with mineral-rich water from a nearby hot spring and can reach high temperatures of up to 140 degrees Fahrenheit. Red-colored bacteria lurk in the shallow waters to give the lake its unique color. The lake is home to around 2 million flamingos, but it's still one of the most inhospitable places on the planet. The lake has an abnormally high level of alkalinity, meaning that going for a swim in these waters would be extremely dangerous and painful. The ancient ruins of Machu Picchu are Peru's most visited site. Tourists make their way through the deep Amazonian jungle and hike up a mountain to visit the famous site. The trek to this site can be pretty dangerous though. If you don't have a guide leading you, you could potentially get lost in the vast Amazon rainforest. The rainforest is home to some of the most dangerous animals in the world, like vipers, anacondas, and poison dart frogs. Happy traveling!